extremely interactive. I want you guys to get as much value out of this as possible. Um, and by the way, um, Cole, please feel free to cut me off if we go long. How, how much time would you like to speak today? You've I'm got, um, I'd say keep it under an hour. You'll be good. An hour. I'm going to try to keep this to about 45, and if we go a little bit longer, that's fine. And again, I want to make this interactive. I want to do the Q&A. I think it's important. So um, I'm going to ask a question because it's kind of my mindset when I was a freshman. Show of hands, how many of you went to school for your degrees to become a computer engineer or something similar? Show of hands. Like when I started school, why was that? Okay, if not computer engineering related, what, what other what other professions are you guys all thinking about? Just go ahead and kind of shout them out. I switched from the doctor of pharmacy program to computer science, so I did just did a complete flip. Okay. Who else didn't raise their hand? What, what other kind of careers are you guys thinking about? More of the security side of the software. The software engineering. Okay. Okay. There's no food. And Ms. Double Major with the finance computer background, what do you think of her career? Same as Adam. Well, I'm actually thinking about um, is investment banking, but if that doesn't work out, then um, anything with computers on call day. Okay, okay. <laughs> I like the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> interesting take on that. So here's why I asked the question. Um, just for context, you know, I, I've always loved computers. You know, I, I was always good with computers. It's probably a common statement for a, a good majority of people that get into it. It's like, hey, I like computers. I can do something with that. I'll go be a, a computer engineer, whatever that means. And I bring that out there because this room's actually got a nice mix, but, um, you know, the, the degree, uh, I don't want to say it's irrelevant, but, man, it's just such a starting point. It, it, computer science, computer engineering, um, cybersecurity, you know, electrical engineering, whatever, whatever that degree title is, and, and I, I feel like the career counselors I spoke with at Iowa State were good, but didn't harp on me as a student enough. That that's a microcosm of a huge career track. We could talk about being a business analyst. You know, when you said finance, computer science degree, my mind instantly went to, oh, she could be a, you know, a consultant at Accenture and doing financial consult software consulting for a financial organization, right? Um, you can get into project management, you can get into cybersecurity, you can get into leadership as a director of engineering and career path, you can get into you know, testing or SDET work or DevOps. So one of the things I really want to impart today is as we go through how to start your career is um, if Iowa State hasn't already done this, I would highly recommend you take a personality test, um, an AIP, um, and again, um, the whole idea is if uh, with our personas, we can be predisposed to be better at certain areas than others. I found out very quickly in my degree that um, I was an outlier um, in that you know, I was probably one of the less than 10% that was extremely social, almost to a fault. Um, wasn't nearly as analytical to have an engineering mindset and have the perfection of like, I want to get every little detail right. And like being a heads down programmer, I did it for four years. Ultimately, I didn't really enjoy it. I could do it, but I didn't enjoy it. And if I had more career counsel early on, I'm, man, Chris, what about your writing skills could really translate to being a business analyst or a project manager or a technical writer even? Um, it might have opened a lot of different and unique doors than what I thought my degree could offer. And so, this one thing I want you guys to think about, you ask questions today, is think about, you know, doing some real good research on, you know, this one degree I'm looking at, what are the multitudes of position types that I could go after based on my degree? It's not, at least from my standpoint as a former student, it's not nearly as narrow as you may think. So, go ahead, question, yeah. So with that in mind, if you were to go back to Iowa State and do it again, would you do the same degree but pursue a different career path or do a different degree? That is such an excellent question. And I've actually often thought about it. Um, my knee jerk is I would get the same degree, um, this is a knee jerk, only because in my profession, so I fell in the technical recruiting uh, in 2006. I quite literally fell in, but no one was going to be a tech recruiter today. And turns out technical recruiting, at its best, is really multidisciplinary. Um, it's a sales position. It is a technology position in that I have to understand people's technical backgrounds. I have to qualify 
client's demands, if they say, I need to hire a, an embedded software engineer, I have to have that tribal knowledge. Say, oh, embedded, okay. What's your technology stack? You see plus plus and Linux, you guys are on the Windows side, you know, what uh, what core technologies are really important to you guys? Was a Python shop. So the engineering degree afforded me domain expertise um, and to get my career started as an engineer so that I could ask um, appropriate questions. Um, if, if I'm really pragmatic about it or, or really put a finer point on it, I probably would have been best served with an MIS degree to blend business and tech if I had known I was going to be, you know, a technology recruiting, you know, I've got my own firm now and everything. And having some business sense to go along with my engineering for me personally would have probably been a more natural fit. Um, quite frankly, I've probably done a little better at my degree program as well. I kind of struggled and had to really fight to get to my degree and all that. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. I mean, the, you know, the good news is that, man, once you get that degree and you've had your first job, no one's going to ask you about GPA, no one's going to ask you about, you know, anything that's germane other than, you know, kind of how you qualify for the position. And so the engineering degree for me personally, professionally, gives me a ton of credibility when I get, hey, welcome. When I get to go into a, uh, a conversation with a, a, a candidate and say, hey, we get a peer to peer conversation. I'm not some HR professional. I am an engineer by degree and by trade. I understand, like, I've, I've walked a few lives of code in my day. Um, the client and candidate gives me exceptional credibility in what I do. So it's a long way to say I, I probably would do the same thing again, but the best path for me professionally probably would have been an MIS degree. Good question. So um, let me go through this kind of PowerPoint I've got, a little presentation, and then let, let's keep it interactive like that, though. I like kind of pausing and answering questions good. So the way I'm going to title this is how to start your cybersecurity career, but now that I know the audience a bit better, I'll just say how to start your technology career, because it's going to be a little more germane to the conversation. So the first thing I kind of put out there is define your professional goals. We've been touching on that a little bit already. But um, first thing I want to talk about is what are you passionate about? You know, why did you pursue this field? Um, again, I'll go back to originally when I got my engineering degree. <coughs> computers, I always knew I wanted to be an engineer because I thought I did. And I knew that a uh, computer engineering degree from Iowa State would give me credibility. I knew it was a record for uh, school. I knew that uh, it was challenging. I loved the campus. I mean, I don't know how many of you have gone to other college campuses that are Drake, but it's a world class institution. You know, even out here in Seattle, you'd be hard pressed to find a more uh, robust, more gorgeous language university. Like it's it's a top-notch education, and so I just looked at it pragmatically and said, if I get a computer engineering degree, you know, I can kind of write my ticket, and that part was mostly true. You know, it gave me a lot of credibility and, and opened up a ton of opportunity to go But I want you guys to think about, you know, why are you doing what you're doing? You know, it's got to be more than my parents want me to go to college, or I think I should, or I didn't know what kind of degree to pick, so I just picked this. Because, you know, to be real blunt, I think a lot of folks get into engineering for a couple of key reasons. They're smart enough to do it. Welcome. They may or may not like computers, but they probably like computers. But they're smart enough to do it, and they figure they can make a good living doing it. Is that a fair statement to make? Why well, a lot of us get into degree, right? Um, if you don't love what you do, it's irrelevant, okay? I, I forced myself to be a software engineer twice at uh, two actually world-class organizations, both in manufacturing, uh, New Core Steel and IDP. And both companies provided full-stack software engineering. I basically had my own projects as a junior software engineer. I was developing, testing, implementing, like, my, my, my work was on the production floor generating revenue for package tracking at a multi-billion dollar organization. And looking back, I had no idea how bold of an opportunity that was. I wasn't some segmented junior developer at a huge company and, you know, one of my favorite consultants said, you know, you weren't making the roundy buttons more round. You know, I wasn't doing something irrelevant or mindless. It was really impactful work. The steel mill I worked for was a you know, multi-billion dollar organization as well, and I was the only software engineer at our plant. And despite all of that, I wasn't ultimately happy. And so I had to really look inward and say, I have great bosses, I've had great job opportunities, why am I not excited to go to work? It's because ultimately, I didn't like heads down software engineering, I didn't like coding all day long, it didn't suit me 
personally, they give me fulfillment, and they can love their journey itself of solving a problem, which, you know, as I say that, it sounds ridiculous. Like, how, why would you get your degree in software engineering if you're like coding? But I had to learn that through trial and error. I had to learn that through being a professional software engineer and what that actually looks like. And so, again, go back to when you define your professional goals, really think about what brings you joy. When you're doing a class project, do you find that, man, you really do get excited about the coding part? Maybe you get more excited about defining the requirements and almost playing that role of project manager. That should be a tell. That should be interesting. Like, huh, if I like that part of it, maybe I should consider more project management and consulting. Um, you know, if you like, at the end of the day, you love debugging someone else's code, you should be thinking stronger about being a, a tester or an SDET or something. Like, you know, really think about when you're going through coursework, what brings you the most joy, and start with that, because then you can start saying, okay, based on that, let me look at job descriptions out there that focus on what I like the most. Right? I might have actually fallen into technical writing. My, I did. I have straight A's in my English courses. I'm, I'm a great writer. I really knew how to write a professional document. I was just pride in that. And, and technical writing, that's exactly what you do to document technical stats. Um, so it's something to really think about. What brings you joy? And from there, kind of guide you into what you can do professionally that you may not have thought of going into your degree. Um, that's one thing to think about. So define those professional goals. Um, think about this, too. Once you find those, define those goals, how do your goals tie into the type of an organization you would like to be a part of, okay? So, I didn't really have that luxury when I graduated. I was a very average student. I graduated in the peak of a recession, okay? I graduated in 9-11. It was an awful time to be on the market. Most of my straight-A you know, colleagues, quite frankly, were unemployed when they graduated in 2001 and two. And I was working, and I was just average. And so I was working because I hustled. I worked really hard to land a job. I called over 60 companies before LinkedIn ever existed, cold called them on, hey, my name's Chris Bloomquist. I'm a soon to be graduate of Iowa State University of Computer Engineering. I want to work for your organization. Now, for me to be able to do that, I had to define going in what kind of an organization do I want to be a part of. So for me, it was very pragmatic. I had a girlfriend at the time that was moving to Sioux City, Iowa. And so I had a very narrowly defined job search. I'm like, I'm going to Sioux City, Iowa. I'm going to find a software engineering job. Who the heck hires software engineers in Sioux City? There was Blue Buggy, okay? There was IDP. Um, there was, at the time, Gateway Computers was already starting to go down, but they were out there. Um, this dates me, I'm over 40. But I had to find my market to find, okay, what organizations are out there? And I started reading their mission statements and their careers page and what kind of opportunities they have. But in that way, I can make a real targeted job search. So you want to think about what's going to drive your job search and the kind of organization where you're part of. Is it that, hey, I've always wanted to, to live in New York City, so I'm going to target that market and I'm going to work with the financial sector. Or, you know, I don't really care where I go from a logistical standpoint. I just always wanted to work for a, a, a green technology, a, a company that's combating climate change, you know. So go after that. Think about what kind of organization you can be a part of right now that I would say that could show that you have an interest in that. Clubs, events, whatever. So defining your goals and then from there going into what type of organization you want to be a part of can help you work backwards and say, what kind of courses should I be taking now? What kind of uh, volunteer organizations can I be a part of? Maybe something as simple as, gosh, there's this great company in Des Moines that I've always wanted to work for in the financial sector, and they have a monthly meetup. Go attend that with other working professionals. Go professionally network in person. I think if you did that, most employers would be, first and foremost, shocked that a student is taking that initiative to know about the professional organizations that they're promoting, and second of all, taking the initiative to actually attend one of those meetings. I never see these students go to these things. That would make you really stand out as a potential future candidate. Even now as a freshman or a sophomore, getting those connections now, think about how invaluable that would be if you meet a software engineer in a company to work at that's nearby, that in three years is now the dev manager, and you're graduating and you have a relationship from three years spanning that time, that's really taking your career in your own hands and driving it, making a strategic investment in it. So 
think about your current goals, type into the type of organization, and then see where those people live and work, and what kind of events they're going to, and being a part of that um, ecosystem. Does that make sense? I've said a lot. Quick questions on any of those things. No, we're good. It, uh, quick show of hands. How many of you know meetup.com? Show of hands. One. Write this down. Meetup.com. It is not a dating site. Let's <laughs> <laughs> like start with that. This is Jermaine. So, meetup.com. It, it is broader than just professional networking. There's meetups for anything. Chihuahua lovers of Seattle, you know, um, skyscraper enthusiasts, but a majority of meetups are geared towards professional development. So, for example, what we here in Seattle that's very hot right now is the AWS Architects Meetup of Seattle. Uh, my good friend Terry Rodigo uh, started this meetup just one person on her own five years ago, and now it's got, I think, over 500 or 1,000 followers. They celebrated the five-year anniversary, but they have guest speakers from Amazon, Google, Facebook. You know, I, I help support that meetup. And uh, they get you know, 30 to 70 people show up. They're all professionals in their, in their trades, some of them are hiring managers, and they're all talking about the latest and greatest <coughs> WS technology, and so not only keeps you know professionals up with their craft and one of the latest trends, but it's also great professional networking. It's like, oh, Sal, nice to see you again. Oh, I heard you changed jobs to WatchGuard. What's it like there? I've always wanted to work at WatchGuard. So it, it really helps you be plugged in, and I guarantee you in the Des Moines area, there's, there's probably some relevant meetups, maybe their names too. But uh, it's worth exploring. You know, Meetup.com and look up things like cybersecurity or cloud technology or even embedded, whatever your passion is. Maybe it's financial software consulting. You mentioned the finance part of it. But um, go, go to those meetups. Don't just sign up, but go and attend them and start getting into that, plug into that professional community. Um, you know, one thing that I did um, write specific to cybersecurity, but I'll make it a broader point. I wrote down how important is cybersecurity to the company. Um, okay, I'll make that a broader question, which would be how important is the uh, position you're applying for to that organization? And here's what I mean by that. When I was a software engineer at Tyson Chicken now, or IDP now Tyson Chicken, um, at the end of the day, they're a meat producer, right? Uh, beef, you know, uh, pork. Chicken, like they, they, their goods are, are nothing to do with you know, software per se. They sell food, protein. Um, however, the software engineering department was fairly vital to the organization because we did product tracking, um, we did inventory. Like there was still a fair amount of revenue generation that happened via software. And so I would argue that even though I was at a non-software company, software was fairly core to the organization's success. And uh, had a large, you know, IT and software department. Um, new core steel, very different. Uh, it was completely manufacturing. They're making steel. Um, yes, they used some level of technology to track inventory, things like that. But there wasn't nearly the focus as my prior organization. And as such, I was my position was much less important to the organization. Right? It wasn't as vital to revenue generation. And I bring that up because you want to think about, you know, especially if you're getting into the, the uh, IT side of things, whether it be help desk, desktop support, uh, IT infrastructure. You know, if you're an IT manager at a law firm versus an IT manager at a software consulting firm, you can better believe the compensation, the whole package, the, the value you bring to the organization at that software consultancy is probably a lot higher than the law firm. The law firm they care about litigation at the at the you know IT service provider, they care about the product is software. And so part of when you do your job search, not only do you want to identify what you're passionate about, what kind of organization you'd like to be a part of, but also how much do they value the position that you could possibly be going after. And you know, you don't want to be easily replaced. You don't want to be outsourced to, to uh, you know, third world country. I mean, that, that's a real world thing that happens regularly. And so you want to make sure that when you go to an organization that, hey, understand how many people are doing the same job I'm doing. You know, what's the vision for the IT organization? What's the revenue that generates? How important is my job to the bottom line business? Um, another really important thing to think about. 
As I relate to cybersecurity in particular, I will tell you that cybersecurity is still not, it, it's hot, but it's not, people don't view it as something you have to have, which is crazy to say. But you know, Primera had a big hack a few years ago. Target, about four or five years ago, had a major hack, a, a data breach. You know, Facebook, all these big organizations have had data breaches, and those organizations had very much kind of reactively said, okay, we're gonna hire a bunch of cybersecurity professionals because we have a problem. But cybersecurity in particular is one of those where if it's not broken, don't fix it, unfortunately. And I feel like a lot of organizations don't necessarily proactively invest in cybersecurity until they have um, a breach. And so um, I, I put that as a bullet point just because again, you want to make sure you understand how valuable your role is to the organization. How much is it a priority to have your position at that company? Does that make sense? Yeah. Excellent. Um, job search tools. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a few, but then I'm gonna ask kind of the class what you guys have seen out there because in the you know 15, 20 some years since I graduated, this has changed dramatically. So um, I just need a general list. So the IC Career Center. You know, obviously, show of hands, how many people have gone to the um, uh, the annual uh, career career events at the Hilton Career Fair, Engineering Fair. Excellent. Keep that up. Even as a freshman, if you're not ready for internship, go. Because you're going to learn how does it work. I will tell you, again, you don't know how good you have it. Most universities don't have nearly the career fair that Iowa State puts on. Even the University of Washington, world-class organization, they're borderline lazy. They don't have anything like what Iowa State puts out. They, they don't do it. They, they just figure, oh, they're going to get their degree, and they'll be smart, and they'll figure it out. And they don't support engineering the way Iowa State does. So really take advantage of that. Um, I found that I would go every year, whether I was on the market yet or not, because some of the same people from the same companies would keep coming back. I say I saw the same guy from Alcoa three years in a row, and by the time I'm a senior, he would remember me. He said, oh, Chris, good to see you again. Now you're graduating, let's have a conversation. Um, so I, I started getting interviews that way because I built relationships with these recruiters or these hiring managers years before I was ready for internships before I graduated. So that, that definitely helped my job search to keep doing it. And I would say, um, Really, don't just go, but really prepare in advance. You know, make a list of the top 10 companies that you have to see. Make the rounds, you know. Um, have all your resumes printed out, ready to go. I'm sure many of you, like this is, you know, is obvious, especially for you freshmen. Like, treat, treat it like it's game time, because it is. That's a golden opportunity, people, in person. And I will tell you, that personal connection is so valuable when you go for a job search because now you're top of the pile. It's like, oh, I remember Sally. She was really sharp. Yeah, I should, I should have a conversation with her. Right? And you start separating your resume from the path. And so uh, keep building those relationships and make it a point. This is something I didn't do necessarily. Is follow up after the career fair, a week or so afterwards. Give them more time to get back to their careers. Hey. Mr. Kakali, it was such a pleasure to meet you. I learned a lot about Alcoa today and what you guys represent in your organization. You know, I'm really looking forward to continuing our conversation as I go into my career and my graduation date as this date. And uh, let me know when it makes sense to follow through the future conversation or learn more about your organization. Like something really tight and professional that shows that you're uniquely interested in that person at that organization. Um, to that end, how many of you have a LinkedIn page? Show of hands. LinkedIn? How many of you know what LinkedIn is? Yeah, that's better. <laughs> um, LinkedIn is a must, okay? It's not a nice to have. I usually have this conversation with uh, people north of 40 because they look at it as social media and they want to be part of it. Um, you know, your demographic usually gets it, but um, LinkedIn is a requirement for any professional in the world. Um, please do send me an invite after class. Um, to my page, which is Chris Woodward's Theory of Technology, um, for two reasons. One, I'm happy to share my network with you. Um, a lot of my network is Seattle specific, but I've got you know over I've got several thousand connections, and these are to direct employers. I'm a recruiter. This is what I do. And so, by being connected with me, you have more direct access to uh, a litany of startups, great organizations um, out there. But uh, more to the point. You want to have a real manicured LinkedIn, okay? 
So a couple key points. So it's going to rattle through them, take notes. Um, professional headshot. You don't have to go to, you know, go pay for it or whatever, but don't be at a party, right? Don't, don't have a picture with your dog at the beach. Like, I mean, maybe it's fine, but look pro, right? LinkedIn is not Facebook. Cannot stress that enough. Um, it should look like if you have a professional website on, you know, johndoe.com, man, it's pro. I look at it, professional headshot, title, um, your professional affiliations, degree, um, professional work experience that is relevant to your degree. So if you don't have any yet, if you have an internship yet, that's fine. Just make a basis landing page and say software engineering student or whatever it is that I was taking university. Maybe it's a, a very quick bio, but uh, clean, professional, and updated. The other thing that I see as a common um, mistake, if you have had some internships, if you are ready to be in the workforce, make sure your LinkedIn data is a mirror image of your resume, okay? Because if I see different dates, if I see employers listed, not listed, it's a red flag. Huh, why didn't they put that on the LinkedIn even though it's on their resume and vice versa? They're trying to hide something, or they just lack of, you know, lack of details. Like what a question, it makes me have questions more than answers, which isn't good. So you have to have LinkedIn, but it should be a reflection and a subset of your resume. So if your resume tells you know most of the story, your LinkedIn is kind of a truncated version of it. Um, and, and obviously, if you get recommendations on there from professors, if you look at mine, I've got over a dozen recommendations from people that I've placed, people that I've worked with, people that I've worked for. Um, it gives you credibility, right? This is the kind of person who is doing this. This is the kind of you know work he's done that can be vouched for. Um, you know, it, even if it's like maybe in your senior design class, you can write recommendations for each other. Man, you know, working with Charlie was such a pleasure. He was really on point, always on time. Like. You know, help each other out a little bit too. If there's ways you can um, bolster each other's um, you know, credentials, people look at that. So have a professional LinkedIn. Make sure it's really well managed. Um, I talked about meetups and user communities a bit. Um, how about market ready resume? So have you guys you know had any kind of a resume seminar classes yet? Yes, no. Show of heads, shaking, not shaking. Okay. Um, shout out some general things you've learned from these resume courses. What do they tell you in terms of how to write a resume? Go ahead. They really hard on uh, having an objective statement. An objective? Yeah. What else? Same font throughout, uh, clean, neat, lined up, headers, skills at the top. Um, looking for uh, making it job specific, so looking at, looking for um, things that are in the postings of jobs, making sure that you include those keywords in your resume for um, descriptions of your jobs. That's good. How many times they tell you have a one page resume? They tell you that? Yes. Yeah, that's crap. <laughs> <laughs> so. The, the academia and I always take this a decent to good job of resume advice, but it's also, I would just say this, resumes are very specific to a market and to a time and place. So what worked when I graduated is not necessarily effective now. So here's what I say about resumes is know your target audience, okay? Um, as an example, uh, you're going to get your PhD in computer science and you know you want to be a computer science person. Okay. Um, you're, not write a, you're not going to write a resume, you're going to write a CV. Okay? Very different. You're going to lead with your academic credentials. You're going to lead to publications. You're probably going to have a four or five page dissertation on every little nuance you learn in computing and neuroscience and how it affects monkey brain waves or whatever you've got your PhD in, right? Like, it's going to be this very verbose and lead with all of your publications and academic credentials. That resume will fail miserably at Microsoft. It'll have no relevancy whatsoever because it's, it's for the, the private sector. So my point of that illustration is really know when you write your resume, what does that target audience expect? Okay? But you were just saying earlier about leading with an objective, skills, your experience, and then your um, academic credentials and affiliations is spot on a great resume format for my world, which is the private sector. 
Right. So software engineering companies, they're very tactical to the point. Yep. My name is this, I am this, I am a junior software engineer. My objective, if I choose the right one, which you don't have to, but if you do, is to obtain a software engineering job in the Seattle area, specifically using my C++ skills and embedded hardware systems. Whatever it is. But tailor it to the audience, tailor it to your back. And the next part, I see the skills. And I see things like, if you are a software engineer, take me through the software development life cycle. You can tell me front end, middle to your back end. You can tell me about you know, um, different um, code repositories, my GitHub account, my my uh, hacker rank, whatever it is. But you can break it down in terms of technology stack, in terms of software development lifecycle. Here's what I've done software testing, development, implementation, support. Then in your professional credentials, it's really brass tacks. Employer, dates of employment, title, excuse me, four or five bullets on what I did, how I did it. This is the part you write down, guys. What you did. How you did it, and the value to the organization. This last point is the most important and gets missed by senior engineers all the time. They get so caught up on why well, wrote this API in C sharp and it did this, that, and the other thing, and that, that's great. Who the heck cares? I want to know why did your organization value that contribution? I want to know that it drove. 60 million more hits per month because I wrote a scalable solution that was viewed by thousands of people, of millions and hundreds of millions of unique visitors every month and drove $240 million of additional revenue over the course of the year. Those kinds of statements are much harder to quantify. Okay, it takes a little more work. You're going to have to be more conscientious and thoughtful about what you can say versus what's speculation. But even things like, I worked in a five-person team, and it was a, a financial application that supported you know, uh, accounting professionals and, and, and had help with engineer. Just something gives me a sense that you understand the business value of your technology contribution. We get so wrapped up as technology professionals to geek it out on, well, I can, you know, I'm the fastest to truck over on the planet. Well, who cares if you don't understand the value of your organization, or quite frankly, if you can team up with others. I've, I've worked with lots of campus that are really brilliant jerks, and I would never hire. You know, they might be the top one percent of the class, but if you can't team up with someone, I don't care. You're not valuable to me. Because I know I send you to a client, you're going to fall on your face when I'm to say this person's fired because they're a jerk. I've hired a fire jerk. Brilliant jerks. They're unemployed. So, you know, think about, again, you know, how are you valued as an organization beyond just the technologies? I want to see tech, but show me a broader view of the value, okay? The ROI, return on investment of your contributions. Um, and then, yeah, go, go into the resume format. So, again, it's, it's name, it's title, maybe or maybe not objective, and kind of read away on that. Um, professional skills, work experience, and then in the end, um, you have academic affiliations. You're at, you're at Iowa State graduation date, your degree, and then any other organizations you're a part of. Um, and if there's something that you want to bring that is more personal but relevant, um, maybe put volunteerism. You know, if you've always wanted to work for a uh, healthcare clinic as a software engineer, and I put on there, you know, volunteer my time in a local uh, you know, area of veterinary clinic to help with uh, you know, euthanized animals or whatever, like something that's, that shows that you have some relevancy to that organization with your free time. I think that's actually really interesting and valuable. And sometimes just maybe some color commentary. Hey, I'm passionate about you know, video games, the environment, and long walks to the beach. I don't know. But, but something that, you know, without the TMI, might make you more interesting Canada. At the end of the day, it's human tiring humans. Make yourself a human. Make yourself more than just a resident. You know, it's a different way to do it. Does that make sense? Yes. And if you have to tell that story in two pages, it's two pages. That's okay. Yeah, go ahead. How would you do it for like a non-traditional student? So I'm older, obviously, than everybody else in the room. So I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so I have like 15 years of work experience at the same company, and I decided yeah. to just switch and change. So. I have no work experience in the field I'm going into. None. Uh, so 
So how do you like? I don't know how to transition those skills. I have a lot of soft skills that are great, but I don't have any on the job technical rest. skills. Good news first. Um, the average adult has about a half dozen career changes. A half dozen in a lifetime. So it happens all the time, but obviously you can be young. I would say you want to, knowing that you've had a full career uh, before, you definitely want to highlight it without overemphasizing it. Um, keep it high points. You know, I was a controller for this organization, handle financials, reporting, whatever. A um, couple quick bullets. But then you focus on most reasons like maybe academic projects, your PhD program, your thesis, whatever it is. So I wanted to know that you've had that career. I'm working with a real interesting gentleman right now named Bob. Bob, um, I'm just making it up. So Bob is a local guy. He's five years away from retirement. He was a patent attorney for over 20 years. He got both his bachelor's and his master's from MIT. Bob is brilliant. Bob is one of the nicest, humblest guys you've ever met, and he's reinventing himself and just getting his new CS degree from UW Bothell and trying to become a junior software engineer. Now, it's crazy. He's been a patent attorney. He's probably made well over two or three hundred thousand dollars a year. He's had a whole career behind him, and now I'm trying to be a junior dev and making seventy k a year just because he wants to have fun and to not dip into retirement. So. You know, part of it is I think it takes a little more of a unique resume. So I've had a focus on I have this career, but here's all my here's my GitHub, here's my class projects, and part of it is you know he's got a good recruiter. I'm his advocate. Um, I've been calling companies directly to say, look, let me tell you about Bob. Um, you're going to get the resume, but let me tell you why he would be such an asset to your organization. And so um, I think it takes a little more creativity. I would highly recommend that you build professional relationships, and this is advice for everyone in the room, build professional relationships with internal technical recruiters or internal recruiters at an organization. So when they did, you can look up recruiter Microsoft, recruiter Boeing, whatever it is, and you can start seeing, okay, these are the people that are actually the gatekeepers, right? These are the people that I want to start getting to know, and I would send them a LinkedIn invite. Let's talk about that for a minute. When you send invites, make sure they are manicured. When I get a random LinkedIn invite, this class aside, okay, because you guys can send me invites, I'll accept. But if I don't know you, ignore, 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 ignore. My network's valuable. The moment I accept that LinkedIn invite, I'm saying to that person, hey, go ahead and utilize, possibly exploit my professional network. You know, I've got thousands, literally thousands of tech recruiter competitors just in my market and they would love for me to share my network with them. That's a one that's taking from me. Okay? So I don't do it. I tell them to pound sand, ignore, 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 ignore. Okay? I don't know you, forget it. If I get a manicure LinkedIn message, hello Chris, my name is Salat. I'm a you know soon to be graduate of, of Iowa State University and I'm hoping to move to Seattle in twenty twenty. I'd love to connect with you. Accept. Happy to do it. Happy to have a conversation probably. So build those relationships, but send a targeted professional message. Think about if you're the recipient, would you hit accept? Right? Okay, like, hey, I'm sending you a, a message, Mr. Mr. Recruiter, because I would love to learn more about your organization. Do you have five minutes to chat? And LinkedIn, you don't get a whole lot of room to send these messages, so you gotta make it really punchy. But hey, if I, if I saw that, okay. I'm gonna hit accept, I'm game. Okay. So build these connections, but be really mindful of it, and be really managed with your messaging, okay? Um, Thank you. As we talk about LinkedIn, we talk about resume best practices. Boy, time's flying here. <laughs> Uh, I wrote something about interview preparation. Um, I'm going to give you some quick bullets. Cole, is this pre is my, are my notes presented up there, or should I just go through it? No, I'll just go through it. I don't see anything. Okay, that's fine. So, take notes on this. Interview preparation, okay? So, um, tell you what, I'll send Cole an email, but here's a quick highlights. Um, first of all, research, okay? If someone's going to take the time to give you an interview, you need to take and really invest the time to make it worth their while, okay? You should go to the careers page. You should know the values page. You should know about the founders. 
You should know about when the company was founded, how much revenue, who the competitors are. Like, why are they hiring? Do your homework. Make them, show, show them that this is a special opportunity for you. It's your top priority. I don't care if you're a 4.0 GPA and you've got 10 of the interviews lined up. You need to treat every potential opportunity like it's the best one because it's the one in front of you right now. Okay? So really take that seriously. Do your homework. And then info drop. You know, right? When I got my foot in the door at IVP, I showed that, you know, I do my research on what the revenue is per year, who the competitors are, what their market's like. I had questions about what their vision was for the organization. Like, I came to play ball. I knew that company and I showed a unique interest in them. And so you want to make sure you really do your homework at that level. Um, read the job description. Make sure you reflect your studies, your coursework, to what they're asking. If their top three bullets in their job description, and they usually go in order of importance, are I need someone with C sharp, Python, and HTML. Boy, the first thing I'm talking about is, by the way, let me tell you about my uh, my senior science project where I got to utilize C sharp, HTML, and, and JavaScript in my in my in my application. Make it uniquely relevant to what they want. Okay. Um, know what kind of interview it's going to be. Um, there's a lot of whiteboards out here. These are going to be extremely technical. They're going to go into Fibonacci sequences. They're going to go into big notation, polymorphism, basically your computer science 201, 301 coursework. They're going to hammer you on that. Ask them if that's going to be part of, of the interview. Summer behavioral, completely different. Um, situation, task, action, result. Write this down, star method. Situation, task, action, and result. So it's like the, the way to describe that kind of a behavioral interview is, you know, so I developed this embedded software um, for IDP. Um, what the task was to create a product tracking system using embedded C. I burned the EEPROM to a chip. I would install it in the production floor. And then I would implement my result and test it to make sure it worked properly. The result of which was um, we were able to track, you know, 50,000 more ahead of cattle in a given year based on the application. Shoot from the hip here, but that—that's how you do a star style interview. Completely different than the computer science one. So make sure you know in advance the the, the format of the interview to prepare accordingly. Um, I wrote on attitude versus aptitude. Uh, I can tell in the first five minutes if I like someone, and as contrite as it sounds, people hire who they like. Okay, if you come off warm. People can hear a smile on the phone. You're engaged. You're sharp. You're ready to go. I'm instantly thinking, "Ooh, I like this person. I hope they're qualified because I like this person." And then I'm going to do confirmation bias to see that, "Oh, they got that answer close enough." If I find someone that's kind of short with me, that's not really engaged and distracted, I'm instantly thinking, "Yep, I'm out." I don't care how they do on that question. I'm out. You know, here's a funny way to look at it. In the 12 years I've been doing this, guys, I've never had a client call me, ever, say, I want to hire this person because they got every question right. I've never heard that. So think about that for a second. Like, your goal isn't to go there and just nail the interview and say, man, I got every question right. I'm hired. It's not a test, okay? It's about fit. What I will hear is, man, I want to hire this gal because she asked some really good questions. She was engaged throughout. She took notes. She, um, her design on her application was brilliant. They really went through the software lifecycle and showed me, and we, we discussed the problem. And, you know, by the way, man, we were laughing. We had a great interview, great culture fit. We definitely want to hire this person. Those are reasons for hiring, how you think, how you behave, how you act, how prepared you show, it, your passion. That's why I got hired. I was a very average, well average student, but you're not going to beat me in passion. You're not. And, and when I went to these interviews, I made them count. So you really got to think, hey, how excited would I be if I were on the other side to bring this person into my organization? Because you're going to spend over 40 hours a week with this person, you better like them. That's a big part of interviewing is just building that rapport and that engagement. Okay. Um, we're running out of time here, but I talked about how to close the interview. The only thing I'll write on that is ask for the job. Okay. It seems obvious, but 
If you have a good interview, you need to leave them know it's kind of like, you got a good date? When can I call you? <laughs> oh my God, let's go out again. It's career dating, guys. Man, I always want to work for IBM. I love meeting you guys today. Um, let me know when I can follow up with a nice thank you letter because this is my number one opportunity and I would be um, very much excited to be a part of the organization, right? Ask for the job. Seems obvious, but a lot of people, even senior candidates, forget to do that. So that's it. That's kind of the whole cycle. Um, questions, thoughts, snide remarks. Go ahead. Me? Yeah. OK. <laughs> um, what are good questions? I always struggle like with the interview, with questions to ask um, for the company. Like at the end of the interview, they go, do you have any questions for us? Um, I always struggle with that. Like I always, I tend to ask um, what what they like most about their position, what they like most about the company, what are they passionate like that. about. That's what I ask, but I don't know if that's appropriate. It's absolutely appropriate. Okay. Um, I just sent Cole, you'll have it in your inbox shortly, please distribute the interview prep that I just emailed you. It's specific to in-person interviews, specific to technology positions. So it's very relevant to what you're asking. <laughs> but um, in a nutshell, um, I would say, you know, any questions that show genuine interest. The one that you asked about, you know, what basically what keeps you here? You know, hey, you know what, Ramesh, I see how talented you are. People don't mind compliments, by the way. Ramesh, I see how talented you are. Um, let's be honest, you can work anywhere. Why do you work here? Why do you continue to work here, right? But what, what keeps you here? What, what vision do you have for your team to grow the team? And how do you see me potentially being a part of it? Right? That's a great question. Um, but, but yeah, I love asking that question. One of the best interviews I ever had was for a job I was not qualified to do. It was for a technology recruiting position at Robert Half Technology. I'd never done a career in my life. I had no idea what the job was other than the job description. And uh, I had four years of professional development and one year of sales at Best Buy selling laptops. That was it. I wasn't really qualified to do my job. But I went in there with 20 questions. Um, and to the director, by the way. And I just sat there very consoled and said, hey, tell me a bit about more about Robert Half. I learned this, that, and the other thing. I know you're one of the largest staffing firms in the world. But tell me about the Seattle office. What's your vision for the team here? Uh, tell me about your success record. Um, Basically, I start asking questions and say, sell me on why I want to work here. Yeah, 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 I can do the job. But tell me about you know, tell me about what keeps you here. And I kind of straddle the fence between competent and cocky. Okay, it's close. Yeah. But I but I genuinely showed passion and interest. And they came away with, oh my god, hire this guy. He's almost too cocky not to hire him. Like, who the heck is this kid? We'll give him a shot almost like but, it, but it, it worked because I, I showed that genuine passion and interest. Like basically, here's my background, but, but sell me on why you think I could be a fit for that and I can fill in the blanks on how I think I could be as well. So it was more of a conversation than an interrogation. But um, yeah, um, let me give you some other, I didn't, that's a long winded answer, so let me give you a short winded version. So um, yeah, why is the position open? Um, a great one. Uh, what what traits do the most successful people have in your organization? What common traits, right? That's a big indicator. If, if, if the man goes straight to, well, we are the best C-sharp people in the world, okay, they're really tactical, impactful, they just want people that are really good coders, probably not gonna say that. They're probably gonna say things like, man, you know, when we do our agile on scrum, scrums, like people are really vocal about their ideas and we want a lot of interaction with teams. Or we're big on paired programming. If you're not a real social person and don't like sharing the keyboard, then I think you're not gonna work here. Or, you know what, we are all about our mission. We are trying to do our best to solve global hunger and so compensation be damned and software be damned. That's our core mission and our software engineers have to understand that they're part of a bigger mission. So, you have to kind of ask those questions and then you'll get answers that you can go back and say, oh, Mr. Mrs. Hiring Manager, that's really interesting. 
I've actually done work similar to that here, here, and here, or that's a passion of mine as well. I love getting into you know, a machine learning, and I'm glad you guys are machine learning too. Here's some projects I've done. So asking them what they value and who the most successful people are there, you can come back with, this is how I resemble that remark, right? This is how I resemble what you're looking for. This is how I'm more qualified based on it. Um, another big humdinger question. Um, go ahead. Um, the other one I struggle with is when people say, tell me about yourself. I mean, what's the timeline? What, you know what I'm saying? Like, what do you want to know? Well, I don't know how to answer that. That's a very difficult question, especially if you don't like talking about yourself. I would <laughs> say this. The moment you're talking about your neighbor's cat, you, you're kind of <laughs> off the reservation, right? So um, the best answer is be someone curious but they're on the point. Um, tell me about something. You know, here you go. I like to answer that question. Well, that's a great question. Um, let me just take from a professional standpoint. Um, I have a technical recruitment firm here, technology. I've, I've had this firm for over four years. Uh, I've been tech recruiting for over 12. And I got to tell you, the reason I do what I do is I love what I do. I get to make an impact on people's lives professionally and personally. Um, I know that um, I've had a lot of successes in my career. The companies have, have won accolades like the 500 um, and things of that nature. Um, I've been a top fifth percentile recruiter in my organizations. I'm very proud of that performance. I've had to work hard to get there. Um, so I, I, I love what I do and I think the results speak for themselves with my professional references, which I'm happy to provide. From a personal standpoint, um, I have a lot of interests. Um, I'm a Lego enthusiast. Uh, I have two young daughters, they're ages six and eight, and so I'm a, a husband and a father. I also do, um, I'm an assistant minister in my church, and so I try to give back to uh, both the technology community and uh, the spiritual community as well, and so um, yeah, I try to live a low life. How does that sound? Really great. <laughs> Interesting, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and, and I, my own style doesn't work for everyone, but... I try to let people in a little bit. Um, I make it somewhat personal without going, you know, too deep in the woods. Right. Um, but enough where it's like I just said enough where I probably talk about a half dozen interests in a matter of two minutes, and it might, it might pique some people's interest or others. You know, if I said that an organization that um, is uh, you know, the atheist of America, which by the way my best friend's an atheist. But if I said that to the atheists of America, they might instantly reject me because, oh, he's a Christian and he's, he's a, you know, I don't know if he can fit in my organization. That's okay. You know, if I said something that triggered an employer to not want to hire me, you know what? I may not want to work that organization anyway. So I don't mind doing a little bit of personal in there because it's either going to, it's going to draw the right people in and probably push the, the right people away as well. Good point. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I got, I got, I got two for you. Um, what would be one thing that you would try to say between like choosing person A and person B, both are qualified. What makes um, what distinguishes one from the other? Is it just who you want to work with more? Is it who just displays their, their traits? Communication skills. Communication skills. Because I, I, I can tell, and to be specific, keeping a conversation on point. Um, when you get asked a direct question, you want to have some direct answers. This is what I did. This is how I did it. This was the result. Have a good night. Um, and and did that work out, right? Um, you know, as opposed to if I ask a question and 20 minutes later we're we're completely talking about something off topic, like that's gonna be someone that's kind of distracted and can't focus. Especially as an engineer, I'm gonna be kind of worried that can they just keep the task at hand. So having succinct, crisp, thoughtful answers. Um, the other distinguishing factor, though. I want to hear really great questions. Because if you don't have questions, it just shows you didn't care. You didn't care enough to take the time, premeditated, to write them down and do your homework. Um, there's a saying that goes, the person that's asking the questions is driving the conversation, okay? So you think about that. Like, when you're getting interviewed, intrinsically, the interviewer wants to start the conversation, they have their questions ready. They're gonna go in there and they're gonna ask new questions. But to make it a balanced conversation, you wanna have a half dozen questions or more. And it turns the table, and it makes everything, and it shows interest. And so, you know, going back to the original part about how the questions do I ask, I hate to say this, but 
It's not irrelevant, but it's less relevant about exactly what questions as long as they're tactical or professional. It's more about that you have some that are relevant, right? Um, it just shows that you put care and thought going into that conversation. But shows genuine interest in the job. So to get the answer to your question, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna if, it's, if it's close, I have two qualified candidates, I wanna see the one that communicates the best and shows genuinely the most interest in the position. That's not just a job for them, but something that they wanna be a part of because I know that they'll stay and work hard and do well. At least you hope so. Good question. Yeah, my second one is, uh, what was your, what was your, uh, link, like, what was your information again to contact you? Oh sure. Um, I tell you what, uh, I can say it, but Cole, do you want me to just email it and you can send it out? Yeah, I can send it to them. Yeah. I, by all means, it's on my signature too. But uh, if you just look at my company, it's just Beery Technology, B I R I B as in Victor, I R I Technology dot com. Um, my direct email is Chris at. Gross, you know, half dozen people. It's a startup. You find me pretty easily. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I have my information. If you check me on LinkedIn as well, you'll have my contact information for future reference. Yeah, thanks for asking. Anything else? Sorry. Uh, you mentioned something about um, uh, one of the things that you notice is in an interview if people are writing things down. So would you suggest uh, bringing in a pencil or a pen and paper? And doing that during an interview. Multiple copies of your resume, pen and paper, half dozen questions or more, written down, premeditated before the interview. Okay. Um, absolutely. Bring it okay. in. Uh, know, know the culture of the company, though. Um, the difference from going to Accenture, a, a multi billion dollar consultancy interviewing in New York, versus a you know, a five-person startup in Seattle, very different interview process. The way you address for the, the one in New York, you're going to wear a full suit, you're going to be grilled for probably eight hours to be very behavioral-based. You go to the startup in Seattle, and you wear a suit, they're going to laugh out of the room. Like, who is this kid? Like, dude, we're all in t-shirts and jeans, and I got death metal Metallica shirt. Like, you know, you, you really want to know the vibe and the culture of the organization so that you dress appropriately, you behave appropriately, match that organization behaviorally. Um, and then if you don't know, it's absolutely okay and good to ask, hey, what kind of interview format should I be prepared for? Will it be a whiteboard style? How long should I be prepared for? Is it a half day, a full day? Um, you know, have that, it's fair for you to ask that you feel prepared and that you match the organization as best you can. Thank you. Absolutely. Go ahead. Okay, so this one, I don't know if you would really have an answer to this one, but um, I feel like personally for me, I'm always a little bit like socially awkward, and especially when talking to people that um, I know I should be talking to, because then I have this pressure, it's like, oh, I should be talking to them. Like, I know I've gone to a lot of like um, places where it's like, I should be out there talking to all of these people, and I just don't know how to start a conversation. Or sure. Mm -hmm. Well, I would start with, you're in luck. Our, our degree is full of social awkward people. <laughs> Let's start with the obvious. You know, when, when you do the technology to become sales professionals, I, I'm an outlier. I, I'm one of probably five percent that go into sales, so uh, I am not a norm. Um, and I got lucky, and I found my career path, which was not heads down. So, first of all, I wouldn't worry about it because that's the truth. Um, most you know good engineers are probably a bit social awkward. That's okay. Um, I think to alleviate that concern, realize a couple of things. One, you are going there to see if it's a good fit for you. That's a very different mindset than I'm going to this interview because I need this job, right? In that scenario, they have all the power. In the scenario, hey, I'm going to evaluate if this is a good fit for me, now I have the power, now I'm driving. I'm driving my career path, my decision making. You know, it, the good news is, if you get an offer, you don't have to take it. And you, you know, if you get a job offer, an offer is negotiable, it's rejectable, it's acceptable, it's acceptable. It's we'll talk again in three years to get your offers. It's oh my god, I have to take this job, but I'm not going to tell you that. But I'm desperate. It, it's any of those things, right? Um, and so, but but at the end of the day, it's not like the death. Um, I know it feels like it's kind of a time when you're graduating and you're stressed out and all these things. 
But um, it's not. It's a conversation. So the conversation is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to see if it's a fit for you or not. And I'm giving you this context because when it comes to nervousness, social, awkward things, whatever you may have, like the fears of an interview, okay? Just know that even seasoned professionals like myself have to go through that process, and it, it's an unnatural way to, to accomplish your result, to get hired. And so if you leave with, I'm just going to go there to evaluate and ask questions and see for myself, but truly from your heart, show professional interest, a lot of that stress of having to prove yourself is certainly continuing, right? That you, that you really, if you come with, man, I am so excited and energized, and these are the reasons why I'm excited about this particular role and your team, you know, that kind of passion is contagious and can quite honestly overcome um, any possible inadequacies when it comes to, gosh, you know, I didn't quite say the right thing the right way. I mean, you know, if, if you show a goodness and a, 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 an interest and a passion, people can see that, right? And, and, and the other thing to realize, you're not, you're not interviewing for a professional speaking engagement. You're not being evaluated on that. You're being evaluated on your skills and your fit for the team, right? So, yeah, we have to, you know, do a speaking engagement for hundreds of people that maybe you, your communication skills are, are more important, but in the day you're hired for a skill and a role and just show interest and passion and qualification. Leave it at that. And if you don't get it, you don't get it. So what? You know, one of our closes, the next one opens. I'll uh, give you a quick story because it's true. So I was, uh, my graduate Iowa State, I got my job at, uh, at Tyson Chicken, and it was a good job, and it was in Sioux City, and it all worked out because my girlfriend became my wife for 15 years, and kumbaya, it all worked out. But a year after I got the job, uh, you know, I was at the job when 9-11 happened, okay? And so it went from being a tough market to being an incredibly tough market. Um, people, you know, suit tools had been in the CBI for over 100 years. They're closing shop after 100 years, gone. IDP, where I got the job, they're getting sold to Tyson Chicken. My job was maybe moving to Arkansas. I didn't want to move to Arkansas. Like, the moment I got a job, the market was the heck of a hand basket. And so I said, screw it. Um, my best friend, Ben, who, who is now an executive of Boeing, was a junior engineer at the time in Seattle. He said, hey, come out, bring your girlfriend, come out and visit Seattle, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, our jobs are in flux. We might be unemployed a year after we graduated. Came out to Seattle, fell in love with the place. I came back to my desk the next Monday, and I walked up to my boss and said, Donnie, it's been real, but I'm going to give my two weeks notice. Um, really appreciate the opportunity. But I wasn't doing it. Well, I'm moving to Seattle. And my co workers at the time, and I still remember this, they said, Well, how do you do that? Like, do you have a job there? I said, No. Well, are you going to work at Microsoft or something? I said, no. I said, well, what are you going to do? Like, how are you going to do that? I said, well, it's pretty easy. First, I put in my notice. <laughs> then I get in my car. And I go to Seattle, like, do it. And, you know, it, it sounds stupid, but people have all these barriers of, like, I can't do this, I can't do that. That's bogus. We live in a free country, a free market. Do what you want. I moved to Seattle. I saved up $3,000, man, $4,000 at the time, which was a pittance. I, I couch surfed on my best friend's couch for six months, and um, I took the first job that paid anything, which was ten dollars and fifty cents an hour as a computer engineering degree, you know, graduate, year of experience, working for Best Buy selling laptops. Now you look at that and say, he's a computer engineer, has a year of experience, and he's making starving wages. What the hell is he doing? I saw it as an opportunity. Because the moment I took that job, now I have professional sales experience. And I always thought, you know, I'm pretty social as an engineer. Maybe I'd be better in sales. So I was selling laptops. And I learned the sales process and how to read a, a, a potential buyer and things like that. And I almost got promoted when one day I came into work and I had to qualify the customer. And the customer's name was Doug. And I uh, said, oh, Doug, what brings you to the store? I'm going to buy laptops for my college age kids. Oh, that's great. How old are they? Blah, blah, blah. So you're buying a laptop for a couple of your dollars, that's great. Hey, by the way, Doug, what do you do? Oh, I'm, I'm a, a general manager at a steel mill. I said, new for steel here in Seattle? Said, yeah. I said, Doug, my name's Chris Wilkins. I've been calling you for the past year to get an interview with the organization. Nice to meet you. Which is true, because prior to that, I had been calling Doug at Newcore, not knowing he was a general manager, 
every month for a year say, hey, I'm an Iowa State graduate. I'd love to be a software junior for the organization. Chris, we're not hiring. That's okay. Can I call you in a month? You bet. And then I meet him by chance a year later. Got into software engineering at Newport. He made a position for me that didn't exist. And then three years later, one of my coworkers, when I was getting notice at Newport because I wanted to get into sales, said, hey, I think my daughter does technical sales. She works for this Robert Half company. Do you send your resume? Sure. And that launched my career. So I'm giving you the story of my career backwards to let you know that you, know, you can drive your career, okay? You can create opportunity. When one door closes, another one truly does open. That's how you have to look at it. And if I had never taken that $10, 50 cent an hour, throw away entry level sales job, I wouldn't have launched my career and have my own firm today. So you really have to look at it that way, that every every opportunity is, is just that and take advantage of it. That's a cool story. I've my soap box. Anything else? In the back, go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, so, how many um, you know engineers are busy, uh, especially engineering students? But how many hours a day or a week, I should say, would you recommend to set aside for networking and uh, sending in uh, applications and that sort of stuff? What's your name? Will. Will. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. In my twelve years, I've never had someone ask that question. Oh. You get a start for asking something unique. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. The questions are great, by the way, but that's a unique one that I've, I've never actually had to think about. Um, I would qualify my answer by saying, or asking, how soon is your uh, pending employment? In other words, are you looking for a job in the next three months, the next two years, right? Because there's a gradient there of, you know, how soon you want to be in the workforce versus when you are. But as a recent graduate, let's put it in that context. Um, whether it be I'm going to graduate or I'm going to get an internship, <sighs> I'd say most, right around three months is about right where you can start really hustling. I think if you're applying anything before that, you know, is if you back up, think about what an employer is going to make a hiring decision, they're probably not going to be interview candidates six months before they actually have someone to start. And there are exceptions that are rule. I know that Boeing is an employer, for example. We'll do a big hiring event when they come to Iowa State in the fall, and then they make offers in the spring. So I mean, there's exceptions to every rule. But in general, for a small and mid-sized organization, you're not going to know about your positions until no sooner than maybe three months out. Um, but I would say, you know, ratchet it up based on that. But you can start with building the, the connection first. Maybe not applying that, but you're spending, you know, maybe you spend every. Pick, pick the cruddiest night of the week, a Monday night, right? Pick a night when you're not going to go out to, to sips or size for a drink, right? Let's be honest. <laughs> I know it is. So pick a Monday or Tuesday night, so the night we don't have much going on for an hour, and just look up, you know, slowly go through a list of companies and make some quick LinkedIn connections. Make it professional, make it impactful. Hey, my name is John. I'm going to be graduating this fall. I'd love to learn more about your organization. Do you have the next, you know, do you have 10 minutes for you in the next two weeks just for a basic chat? But start those conversations now because then if you're six months out and then you follow up in three months and now you're starting to apply because you see the position two months out, like you've already got a head of steam with like a professional connection, a little long term relationship, and now that they remember when you apply. And as you get closer to it, that's why I dedicate more and more time to it. I mean, when I was a month out from graduating, I was quite frankly spending almost every night, probably an hour or two every night after class, like I'm applying, applying, applying. But I was also I was researching first and then calling second and applying third, okay? So I kind of did a little unique where I really tried to get someone on the phone, which is more and more difficult anymore, but do it if you can, okay? Get someone on the phone for five minutes. Get them talking. Get them liking you. Get them then connected on LinkedIn. Then apply. Like, if you can build those relationships, you're one step closer to landing a job, right? Good question. And another thing I have to say is be, um, be methodical. Schedule it. Um, Doug would be really smiling ear to ear right now, but different Doug. Um, Iowa State Doug that I was, uh, I, I lived in a former house, and Doug was a, uh, a buddy of mine. He was uh, in the uh, ag, was ag engineering, he was a vet man, he was a vet man. And Doug did his academic career right. Um, I would go to class and then, you know, screw around and do a little more. He was regimented. 
he would go to his campus every day from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., class to class, and all he did that time was study, go to the next class, study, homework, next class. And by 5 o'clock, done. I go to bars, I go have fun, but he treated his academic career like a job during work day to get a fun at night. And you know, looking back, God, that guy really, he knew what the hell he was doing. He was really disciplined and scheduled, and he had a really good balanced Iowa State career. So think of it that way, too. You know, if you have something scheduled, when, I, when I'm at my work day, I have calendar invites come up, and they just tell me, oh, Cole, Iowa State, we're talking here in 15 minutes, and I'm I in advance. Like, I don't have to think about it. I schedule it, so I don't have to remember it, right? So just live by a routine, just live by a schedule, and every step, you know, every, you do it once a week, whatever it is, you're, you're, you're getting this rhythm and you feel good about it, you're making progress. Good question. I do have an appointment in T minus three minutes. Do we have any final questions? Just a comment. Thank you for coming. And this was really valuable. Like all, all of what you just told yeah. me. Yeah. My pleasure. Like I said, cool. Uh, and a round of applause to Cole, actually. And, and I mean that because uh, I've wanted to do this for almost 15 years. It's the first time that some of my Iowa State actually reached out to me. And um, believe me when I say that I, um, I love my university. It's a great experience. Kudos for all of you for going there. Um, the Cyclone family is very tight knit. And so the further you go away from Ames, just know that if you reach out to alumni, you're going to find that the more likely they are to want to connect with you because. It, there is something about being a part of the Cyclone family, whether you realize it or not. And uh, the alumni organization of Seattle is an example, 2,700 members. And I've met people from all walks of life that um, still love the university, even though we're thousands of miles away. So, you know, you guys are a part of something bigger than yourselves. And I'd be more than happy to, uh, you know, give back to Iowa State again and do this again. So thank you very much for having me. And, and uh, I do invite all of you to, to connect with me on LinkedIn and stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Stay warm out there. Go Cyclones. <laughs>